I think um, you've done a lot of work out there trying to help women and empowering women out there. That's what that's what stands out to me from your updates, and I think that's why it's been a passion point for you. But correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is a passion project in general for me, mm. not only because of the the women's rights, but also queer rights. You know, just today um, I posted something about um, how Bitcoiners should actually stand with queer people, because we have been oppressed by governmental um, re re repercussions and regulation all of our lives. Uh -huh. So, and that's what we jointly fight against, actually. And so I don't understand why some Bitcoiners, some, um, always make jokes with the rainbow flag or things like that. So um, I think my resistance to some sort of government restrictions, regulations, and pressure comes from there. And from the fact that I think that Sadly, our world is very unfair. I know this will stay that way, but I think we can change that a little bit um, by our actions or how we go along with other people, how we do our, our relations, how we, we, we be up with one another. Yeah. And so the passion for Africa comes in a way through that because European countries and people from Europe for centuries, for centuries, we went there and stole everything from them. Yep. And now they, they are basically deprived of everything and are in this bad situation. And we are in the like, we are the developed world, the first world. They are the third world. Hey, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this has reasons. They are manifold, of course, but that's one of the reasons. And I want them to, to have the chance to use an open monetary system where they don't need an ID, they don't need a sort of fixed income or wealth or status already to be able to have some sort of economic means to, to be able to save, to be able to get a credit maybe once. Um, um, and, and that's the reason why I'm going there because the need is there much higher than in, in Europe or in the US. Of course, we everywhere in the world, we have disadvantaged people. That's mm -hmm. not the point. I'm also there for them or try with my educational work. Um, but I'm focusing on, on African countries or let's say the global south because they are suffering the most. We have a number of people, the number of people who are living in dictatorships or authoritarian countries let's say basically the, the number of people living in full democracies is going down. So from 2020 to 21, exactly. So more and more people, actually 4 billion of people are not living in a full democracy. I know. And some people want to burn those democracies down. Exactly. So uh, Bitcoin is a lifeboat for all of these people. And um, I also see the crackdown on privacy rights in the digital space. Digital space. Um, it's becoming tighter and tighter everywhere. And um, so I think that basically the people in the global south, if they were to adopt Bitcoin in a self-custodial manner, non-KYC Bitcoin, because they can't be banked, um, they shall stay unbanked. That's my idea. Um, they just should use Bitcoin. And if they more and more use Bitcoin in that manner, then uh, they will save us also from these uh, privacy restrictions because then you have a mixed use of Bitcoin. You can't then say uh, non-KYC Bitcoin, go back into your uh, hole. <laughs> you know, mm. It's not there. Nobody uses it. So we can uh, ban it. They can't ban it then if half of the world is using it. So you want to keep unbanked to the unbanked? Yes. <laughs> that, um, that point on queer rights is actually super interesting because I never really thought about it in that way. That, because, I mean, like I've noticed that. Uh, that undertone of uh, both misogyny and uh, homophobia that exists. I mean, you could, you could just say like certain people in Bitcoin, but it's almost unfair. It's just in society it exists, so it naturally will be in both. But I have seen it. But actually, that affinity that people who are anti-state should have with uh, you know, queer communities, it, it does exist because, I mean, you know, queer people have had to fight for years for just some semblance of equality. And, and even in some places, still don't have it. I mean, you've just been to Africa. I think, is it Uganda? It's still illegal? No, it's, uh, it's not only illegal. I think in Tanzania, you can ha get a life sentence. Yeah. Uh, in Iran, just recently, they hanged gay men. Yeah. So, you know, but so it, the people who are 
uh, vocal proponents of liberty and freedom should be directly aligned with the cause of queer people. So I just, but I'd never had it put to me like that as a something you should have an, an affinity over as people who are kind of like fighting the state. So yeah, good point. So in this, um, can you actually just tell me some of the stories? Talk me through the countries you've been. I just want to know it all. Honestly, it looks fascinating. Well, like, where's your favorite place you've been going to? All our all favorite it. places, in a way, they are all different. Okay. And there are different people doing different projects, and they all have. I learned a lot from all of them. So in in March, I was in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. the second time now, and. Um, is, is Zimbabwe still have massive inflation? Yes, I mean it's even worse now. Like okay. In uh, in March, I think the the exchange rate from uh, US dollars to Zimbabwean dollar was one to six hundred. Okay. Like in twenty twenty, when I was there, it was one to sixty. Okay. And now it's one to nine hundred, or one to a thousand in just uh, the the three, four, or five months now. Do, so, do, would people there holding Bitcoin have a very similar scenario to people that I met when I was in Venezuela, where they said it doesn't matter if the price of Bitcoin goes down, it's still going up for me? Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, to see it exactly, but of course we have to be honest and say if one of the Zimbabweans started uh, at the end of last year to save a little bit in Bitcoin, now he or she also has just half of it. So yeah. that's hard. Um, but for me, the bigger use case there is basically sending money in and out of Zimbabwe. Because in Zimbabwe, we have uh, currency controls. Um, in Zimbabwe, the central bank is really determining the exchange rate. So it's really a controlled market. That's not a free market. Right. And the government and, and the, the financial elites of the central bank, they, they basically extract all the value from the people by their money policies or their bad money policy, you know? And, and is it stupidity or is there corruption there? Are I they stealing the money? It, it, most part is corruption. Right. Um, sometimes I think they also say really stupid things, but they are all educated in the West and things like that. They are very clever people, so it must be malice. And um, they recently said, or they started to issue gold coins. I saw this. Zimbabwe is a very rich country. They have a lot of gold. They started issuing gold coins and said ah, to fight inflation and, and all the money. And they always say it's international sanctions and the others. It's always the others. And it's not they are buying the newest SUVs and mm. things like that. So they are issuing gold coins now. And they said, really, um, as a store of value, we are now issuing gold coins and Zimbabweans can buy gold coins. So the, the joke is nobody knows who is the owner of the gold mines. I mean, hmm? and then the other thing is you get it cheaper if you have U.S. dollars. If you are able to pay in U.S. dollars, you get it cheaper. <laughs> And um, there's an article, um, I can tell you afterwards the link, and uh, somebody really said that's the worst scam he has ever seen, and it's out in the open. So rich people bought all the gold, gold coins and can sell them with an arbitrage of, I don't know, 300 US dollars per one coin or something. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, every tool is manipulated. Um, now there, there's a new movie that was released these days about the last election and of course the the governing ruling party said now the movie is banned uh, people have been gone missing political opponents of the regime and um yeah they are, they are next next year is a new election and um already they are banning the color yellow because yellow is the color of the opponent party and things like that. Is it um is it the same uh, party as Mugabe was? Yes. Is, is that ZANU PF, is it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it is. Um uh okay. And when when you go out and visit there, do, do people understand money? Like my experience in Venezuela is that actually people understood in some ways, people understood money more there than they did, say, in the UK. And what I mean by that is it's not about the education of money. They understood the value of money more in that here, my, my friends all have pounds. That's it. The odd random person might have a bit of Bitcoin, but 99% of people I know, maybe more, just have pounds. Whereas in Venezuela, people knew, right, I need to get rid of my Bolivar. I need dollars. If I can't get dollars, I want Colombian peso, and this is why I want it, and this is how I hold it. They had to learn 
they had to learn what money is because of inflation. Inflation here is just like slow and insidious, so people haven't had to learn. Is that similar in Zimbabwe? It's very similar. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting that, isn't it? And people need to live a whole different life than we do because everything, it's always about money. Every day you ask someone else or look up in the news, what's the price of money today? So how much, uh, what, how, how high is the exchange rate? Because the higher it is, the more expensive goods get. And if you have some money, you immediately spend it. So you don't, you never learn to save money because why would you save it? It's gone in the next day. So you spend it. And um, that's definitely not the right way to, to build some sort of wealth or savings if you always have to spend it. So yes, everybody knows that the US dollar is a much better money than their own currency. And they have this history of hyperinflation in 27, 28 and now they are almost back in hyperinflation. And at the moment, it's the country with the highest inflation rate in the world. Uh, again. Uh, it's Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, uh, somewhere Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, okay. So when you go out there, what kind of um, what kind of areas are you going to? Are you going out to villages? Are you going to remote areas? Are you staying in the town? Um, this time I was only in town in Harare. Okay. And we visited... Um, the Nimbe Fresh Farm in Marondera. Um, the Nimbe Fresh Farm um, is that project where you could buy... Is it the blueberries? Pardon? Is it the blueberries? Yeah, that's yeah. the blueberries. That led to the blueberries. Yeah. Uh, but the first project that did they did with the Sun Exchange from South Africa, it's a company that is crowdfunding solar power plants in South Africa. Good idea, actually, yeah. because they have a lot of sun. And they also, in South Africa, and in Zimbabwe have a lot of power outages. So you have hours where you don't have any power and you need solar uh, then to heat the water and to have electricity. Do they know when the blackouts are coming? Or they just No. Haven't? So the difference is in Zimbabwe, you don't know when they come. <laughs> in uh, South Africa, you they are more developed. Have you been doing lessons and the lights just go out? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. Happens. How regular are we talking? Is it a daily occurrence? Sometimes it depends wow. also uh, on the location where you're at, the quarter of the town where you are. For instance, in the center of Harare, where the hospitals and the government is sitting, you always have power. <laughs> yeah, of course. You always <laughs> but, have power, money, and food. Yeah, exactly. You fuckers. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, but in South Africa, you get a text. Uh, so there are, I think, WhatsApp groups they, where they tell you uh, today at 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. there will be no power. And so coming back to, to visiting Nimbe Fresh, they built this solar power plant uh, on, on the farm um, to be independent, self-sovereign, and uh, to be able to... Um, produce all the time because they, for instance, they showed out, they, they also um, grow tobacco and tobacco needs to be dried. And they showed us um, with, with the, the, the petrol and the wood we're burning, um, the quality, so no, sorry, the petrol and the wood is bad for the environment. The power from CESA with the interruptions, the quality of our tobacco is much worse than now that we have permanent electricity. So, um, and this feeds a lot of people there. Um, the farm has, I think, about 2,000 um, workers at the moment there. Wow. And I was interested in it because the solar power plants, you could buy one solar cell for a little bit of Bitcoin, in Bitcoin too. And uh, you can get some earnings in a way from that crowdfunding now. The solar cells are working and they are selling their excess energy to the grid. 